Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's time to play the Family Feud. Let's welcome our first family down, the Ebertowskis. Come on down. And our second family, the Warren family. Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you for joining us. And without any further ado, let me introduce our host for today, who actually picked out his own wardrobe this morning, Brody Swanson. Good morning, Elmbrook. How you guys doing this morning? Good. Welcome to the Family Feud. This month in our services, we're going to be looking at the inner dynamics of our families, but we thought that's going to be really serious. So while we're at it, why don't we have a little fun? So every week, we're going to invite some contestants. I almost said victims. Sorry about that. Uh, come some contestants up on the stage to answer some questions. One question and see if they can identify the five answers that you as a congregation answered in your survey. But in order to do that, we're going to need your help because you are the studio audience. So they're going to have either a right or a wrong answer. If there is a right answer, you're going to hear a sound that's kind of like this. Okay? And if you hear that sound, we need a riotous amount of applause. So let's try it, all right? Here we go. We're going to warm up here a little bit. All right, here we go. On the count of three. One, two, three. Perfect. There is no game show host in the world that has a crowd like this. This is great. All right. Second, they could give a wrong answer and you would hear a sound kind of like this. And then you're going to need to go, oh, and it needs to be really heartfelt. Okay. So, so let's try it together. All right. Here we go. One, two, three. Very good. Very good. All right. Well, why don't we meet our contestants this morning? I'm going to start out over here. Why don't you introduce uh, you and your wife? Uh, my name is David and Trisha Ebertelski. Uh, we are members here at Elmbrook Truck for, for now about five years. Five years, and where are you from? We, uh, we were born and raised in West Dallas, okay. but uh, we've been living in West Bend for the last uh, three years, mm -hmm. and uh, we, we attend Kettlebrook Church when mm -hmm. we can now. Mm -hmm. Westbrook, or West Bend. Okay, yeah. I think I know where that is. All right, let's go over here. Why don't you introduce you and your wife? All right, my name's uh, Kevin, and this is my wife, Lucy Warren. We're actually from Chicago, and this is our first time here at church today. <laughs> There you go. They are extremely brave. Now, it takes a lot of guts to get up here, and so we're not going to send you home empty-handed. Dave, would you tell them what they're going to win? I'd be happy to, Brody. Today, the winners will get a new card. <laughs> a what? A new card, a black, shiny Mission Cafe card. Mission Cafe, oh. the official sponsor of Family Feud at Elmbrook, <laughs> where the goat is always jittery, the splits have a Congo flair, and yes, the mission statement of Mission Cafe, doing the whole world a whole lot of good. A whole lot of good. All right, so you're going to go home with Mission Cafe cards. Okay, I was like, is he going to give away my car? All right, well, we're going to ask you a question. We surveyed 200 men here at Elmbrook, and I'm going to have the wives step up to the podium here, and you're going to put your hand right here. No, no, no cheating yet, you know? All right, and I'm going to, oh, there, shake hands. That's good sportsmanship. You know, you're the first group to do that, too. Everybody else is like, I'm going to get them. All right. So we're looking for serious answers here, not how to defend the Packer jet sweep or how to change the oil in a 1989 Dodge Charger or how to roll the toothpaste or where the toilet paper goes. We're looking for different answers, okay? And so here is the question that we asked, and you need to finish this sentence. In thinking about our relationship, I wish my wife knew what? Wish my wife knew what. <laughs> ah, all right. We have, yes, what do you think? How to cook. How to cook? <laughs> wow. <laughs> he, does, he does the sly little nod. All right. How to cook, survey says. <laughs> oh. All right, you get a chance to steal and, and go for the big card, I guess. All right. Mow the lawn. Mow the lawn. I wish my wife knew how to mow the lawn. That's a good one. I, that would be a good one. All right, here we go. Survey says. <laughs> all right. Now you get to collaborate. This is not cheating. This is collaboration. We're adults. All right, so go ahead. All right, talk with yourselves just a little bit. Why don't you guys talk to the person next to you? What do you think's on that list? Top five list. Go ahead, just whisper to the person next to you while these guys are 
collaborating. Love Remember exciting. in this, yes, we love each other in this game. So, all right, you got about five more seconds. Five more seconds. I got a lot of respect for your voice, Dave. All right, here we go. All right, why don't we step back forward? We're going to let you have another chance. Here we go. What do you think? How to change a tire. How to change a tire. You have that happen a lot. Okay, how to change a tire, survey says. (laughs) All right, here we go. Knew more about sports. Knew more about sports. All right, knew more about sports, survey says. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see if you can get one more. Can you get one more? And then you guys will have a chance to steal. All right. Let's see here. They're thinking hard. I feel a lot of love in the room, you know, and uh, a lot of respect for you, Dave, back there. And wouldn't give away any hints by my verbiage at all. All right. What do you think? How to iron their shirt so they don't have to go to dry cleaning. <laughs> How to iron their shirt. Okay. All right. How to iron their shirt, survey says. Okay. Last chance. You get to steal and go home the big winners. All right. Here we go. How to clean better. How to clean better. How to clean better. All right. Here we go. We tried. Survey says. Okay. Let's take a look at the answers. You guys actually each, you've done a good job. Let's give a big hand to our contestants. Here's this, here's this. Now hang on, I'll do the answers here. All right, our top five. Number five, could I do number five? Here we go. That I really love her, as Dave was singing the love boat. And I use the word love a lot. All right, number three, my need for respect. Number two, my need for physical intimacy. And number one answer was... How to be more patient and forgiving. Let's give a big hand to our contestants. Thank you for playing. You guys can go have a seat. Well, that takes some bravery, doesn't it? I I tell you what, we had like 200 men respond, and those were the top five answers. Next week, we had about 1,000 women respond to... This is what I wish my husband knew. So I don't know what that says. But uh, I guess we'll find out next week what those are. Now, with regard to the men, here are some other isolated comments I thought I'd bring up. So a couple, or actually, here are some of the other comments. I wish my wife knew who she married instead of whom she thought she married. I, I, I wish my wife knew how to leave me alone when I'm tired and let me watch sports on TV without demanding time or a to-do list. <laughs> Honey, that was not me. <laughs> I, I, this person says, I, I wish my wife knew that I'm far from perfect and I do love her deeply even if I seldom really show it. We need to talk if that's you. Okay. Uh, This person says, I wish my wife knew how painful it is when she ignores my needs for physical intimacy. Another person said, I wish my wife knew how deeply she hurt me and how how angry I will always be. We need to talk as well. Uh, This person says, wife, no, bachelor until the rapture baby. So I don't quite get that, but (laughs) it it was quite fun going through that list. You know, on a more sober note... 60% of all marriages fail. 60%. Think about this. I don't think anyone coming into marriage says, yeah, you know, we're going to last about a year or two before we start going at each other's throats. And then for the next few years, we're going to just dwindle down into bitterness and resentments. And pretty soon we're going to start bickering over the iron, you know. Uh, I don't think anybody comes into marriage saying those things. But 60% of marriages fail. 80% of second marriages fail. Just kind of get that for a minute. Of the kids that are born today, over 60% will see their kids divorced before they're 18. Half of those will see their, uh, their, they'll, they'll see their parents divorced before they're 18. Half of those kids will see their parents divorced twice before they're 18. I mean, just kind of think about that for a minute. That's awful. Just the brokenness, the, the, the devastation that that has all the way around. 
I mean, we get into Scripture and we say, how do we do this thing right? That's what we're doing. We're going to talk today about marriage. I'm going to kind of reflect a bit on those top five things husbands wish their wives knew within some of the points that I'm addressing today. Next week, we'll pick up some of the others as we answer also what uh, the top five things wives wish their husbands knew. But really, we're going to look at really how God designed marriage today. We're in Genesis 2, 18 through 25. If you've got a Bible, turn with me. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in your rows. If you don't own a Bible and you really don't have a Bible, make that your own. Take it home with you. Write your name in it. Bring it back with you every week because we'll go through Scripture together here at Elmbrook. We'll replace that Bible. We want you to have a Bible if you don't own one. So as we begin, Genesis, first book of the Bible, right at the beginning, we're going to look at three things in this passage that, that God wants us to know about marriage. God wants us to know that marriage involves understanding, maturity, and transparency. That's basically it. Understanding, maturity, and transparency. And as we look at these points, as we go through this passage, ask yourself if you're married, is this something I've got? If you're not married, ask yourself, is that something I really want? You know, because I need to know what I'm stepping into if I do get married. If you're on the other side of it and you have no intent on getting married, the cafe is still open. Uh, Feel free to... um, Go grab a coffee, (laughs) do as you wish. Uh, Here we go. God's plan for marriage, number one, understand each other, beginning with verse 18. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, just get this for a moment. If you read through the creation story in Genesis 1 and up to this point in Genesis 2, God creates the heavens and the earth and says, it is good. God creates the plants and the, uh, and, and, and the vegetation and says, it is good. God creates the birds. It is good. God creates the animals. It is good. God creates Adam. And the first time God says it is not good is when, is when Adam is alone. And so God looks and says, okay, this doesn't quite and won't quite do. And so here's what he goes on to say and do. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. Now, I want to focus on those two words, suitable and helper. If you get into the Old Testament, and everything in the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, if you get into the Hebrew words, you really get a glimpse into what this means. The word suitable literally is the word neged in Hebrew. And neged means equal opposite, uh, an opposite that is just like. And so it implies like opposite, same footing, same level of power, same level of positioning, and someone who will complement everything that Adam is. That's the word neged. You know, unfortunately, in our world today, there are so many cultures that don't see women as equal opposites, that don't see women on the same level, that don't treat women on the same, uh, on the same level. Ultimately, this passage in Scripture clears that up. But as you get into other cultures, you'll see that women are treated in many cases as property. They are used, they are discarded, they are mistreated, even aborted because of their gender. And, and so as you get into this, you see this is what God intends. It's an equal thing. It's not a subservient thing at all. And then the word helper is the word azer in Hebrew. So it's neged, an equal opposite, who is a helper. And when you think of the word help, I don't know what comes to mind, but here's what should come to mind. David says this word in Psalm 121. I turn my eyes to the hills, Where does my azer, my help, come from? My azer, my help, comes from the Lord. In other parts in Scripture, as you see this word helper lived out, it basically represents military reinforcements that are brought in during battle. And so this is a help that really can even come from God. It's a a reinforcement. What this is telling us is that God is creating for Adam and then for Eve and Adam a suitable helper, an equal opposite, who is a reinforcement, who gives Adam a strength that Adam would never have on his own, who gives Adam a reinforcement that Adam would never have on his own. That is God's intent in creating Eve. 
And so as we get into the creation story, first and foremost, we're hit with really the value of both Adam and the value of Eve. And, and, and really what God intends in this relationship of marriage. Verse 21, so the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made woman from the rib that he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. So here's the first thing I want to say. God brought her to the man. What is God doing? God is gifting Adam with Eve. So what is Eve? She is a gift from God. I, women, just do you see yourselves as a gift from God? Do you see yourself as literally in marriage as God's gift to this man that you're married to in that way? Because that's how God sees it. That's how God intends this to be. And I wish I didn't have to say this, but I do. And I had one woman coming up to me just in tears saying, that's exactly what I needed to hear. Let me say something to you because I believe God wants me as your pastor to say this to you, women. You're never a burden. You're never something to be thrown away. You're created special. You're a gift from God. The men in your life need to know this and understand this. And if they don't cherish you, and if they don't respect you, they're not respecting and they're not honoring God. Because this is the purpose for this creation. This is why Eve was made. This is the purpose, ultimately, for the marriage that they're in. And so he brings her to Adam. Notice that he presents Adam with Eve. He doesn't present Adam with a career. Guys, he doesn't present Adam with a career. Adam already has a career. He's naming everything, you know, but that doesn't fulfill him. You know, that, that doesn't quite give him what he needs. Now, ultimately, our fulfillment only comes from God, but in a marriage, there is a fulfillment on a secondary level that nothing else is going to replace. No career will, will replace, no hobby will replace, no, no object, no car, no computer or TV or anything else will replace the intended purpose for Eve and, and, and for marriage. And so God presents Adam with Eve, not, not something you plug in. Uh, for example, I, I took this, <laughs> I clipped this article about 10 years ago it was from the London News, and it's just, it makes me laugh. I, I don't know if you will or not, but uh, listen to these words. An Australian man has resorted to extremes in being completely frustrated with women. The nuptials of Mitch Hallen, age 42, and a widescreen television set have been performed in his apartment in the presence of a priest and a dozen of friends. One of the wedding rings Mr. Hallen put on his finger, the other he put on his TV. In Mr. Hallen's words, he's always been unlucky with love. After two divorces, he decided to give up on women. My television gives me innumerable hours of pleasure without fights or argument, the newlywed is quoted as saying. Television is the best friend I ever had. It is a wife who will never grumble. I thought that was pretty funny. You and me, back there, I heard that laugh. You know, God presents Adam with Eve, not anything else. Guys, understand, God created us. God knows us. There is a fulfillment on a secondary level that we're not going to have outside of marriage. And then the second thing is, notice this, that Adam and Eve are both made differently. It says here that God then made Eve. Now, getting into the Hebrew, the word for made is the word bana, which means to painstakingly build. And it's intriguing as you get into the Hebrew and you look at the word for God making Eve, and then you go back and you look at the word for God making Adam, it's not the word bana. It's the word yatzer. It's really interesting. And why do I bring up this? Because this, this tells us that God made Adam and Eve differently, and God made men and women differently. The word yatzer is the word that describes how God created animals in Adam. I don't know what that says. But it means to squeeze into shape with your hands. So God yatsers Adam and yatsers the animals, and then banas Eve. He painstakingly builds Eve. What this tells us is we're made differently. 
What this tells us is that we're wired differently. We're made to have different needs. We're made to have different ideas. We're made to be completely different in so many ways. And I, for one, am grateful for those differences. You know, but so often in marriage, it's those differences that really keep us in conflict with each other so much. There's a book out by Willard Harley a couple decades ago. And Willard Harley talks about his needs, her needs. That's the title of the book. And he lists the top five needs that men have in marriage and the top five needs that women have in marriage. And it's really interesting because when you look at these needs, and I'll put them up in a second up here on the screen, you'll see that none of them correlate. Uh, So just kind of take a look. His needs, the top needs for men are, number one, sexual fulfillment. Any surprises in the room? Raise your hands. Notice no hands are up, okay? Um, Notice the top need for the woman. Affection without a sexual agenda. Okay, so we've, all, we've already got a problem here, don't we? Notice the other needs for men. Recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support, admiration. You might put respect under there. Top need for women. Affection without an agenda, followed by conversation. Honesty and openness. Financial support and family commitment. There are no correlations. There are nothing on there that actually says, okay, we've got the same set of needs. We are made differently. We need to understand that we're made differently. And speaking of the top needs for men and for women, I did a message years ago entitled, Men Are Like Microwaves and Women Are Like Crock-Pots. And let let, let me explain, because maybe I can kind of clear up some things for you guys. Um, Men are like microwaves. They take about 60 seconds to heat up. Okay, crock pots on the other hand, if you want anything out of at night, you got to turn them on in the morning. <laughs> so remember, <laughs> remember his needs and her needs, they're very different. And as we come together, we have these differences, and these differences are going to clash. And we go wrong when we start projecting our needs on our spouse. When we come in and say, okay, I'm getting married and I'm expecting you to have the same needs I have. We go wrong when we neglect the needs of our spouse. We go wrong when we come into marriage and we're so me focused that we're only about our needs. We go wrong when these things happen. God says, you know what? Marriage is going to be hard work. And that takes us to point number two. See, the first ingredient in a healthy marriage is understanding. We've got to understand each other. We've got to understand how God has made us. We've got to understand that we're different. We've got to understand Yatzer and Bana. God has made us differently. And, and, And we've got to understand the purpose of marriage. And here we've got to, secondly, embrace maturity. Well, I'll tell you why. Someone once said that marriage is like a phone call in the middle of the night. First you get the ring, then you wake up. Explain that to your neighbor if they don't quite get that. (laughs) But think about this. Seriously, think about this. God creates us completely different from each other, with a completely different set of needs from each other. He brings us together so that we might come together as one, and, and we are now becoming one with somebody who is completely unlike us, who sees every flaw and every weakness that we possibly have. I mean, that that's like a recipe for disaster. So either God has a really sick sense of humor in marriage, or marriage is one of God's ways for maturing us. And I think it's the latter. You see, I think truly marriage is one way that God takes us and shapes us and molds us and moves us past me first kind of thinking and moves us past it's all about my needs and moves us into an attitude of servanthood as Christ came ultimately as a servant. Number verse 23, it says this, Then the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And get verse 24 here. This is why a man will leave his father and mother, and he is united with his wife, and they will become one flesh. That is why. So notice what this is saying. A man will leave his father and mother, He will be, secondly, united with his wife. And thirdly, they will become one flesh together. Let's take a look at all three of those. First of all, he will leave his father and mother. Notice that there is a leaving involved in marriage. You're leaving your family of origin. You're leaving your mom and dad as your primary home. 
You are now moving into what is your primary home. You're leaving and you are establishing a different home. The second thing that you're leaving is oftentimes you're leaving bad patterns. You're leaving bad ways of reacting. You're leaving bad behaviors. You're leaving addictive behaviors. You're leaving perhaps abuse or abandonment or other things that you need to leave so that you might forge a home that is built on Christ the solid rock instead of on what you knew. And so there's a leaving involved, and then there's a forging of a different reality. And your new home becomes the home. It becomes literally your new home in that way. And is united with his wife. The word united is the closest word in Hebrew to glue. Literally, it means we're stuck with each other. We're stuck together, we're clung together, and we're glued together. And there's a sense of permanence in this word. And that's what happens. And we are united with our wife. She is united to me. I am then united to her. And and literally in every way, we're stuck with each other through thick, through thin. We're stuck with each other for better or worse, richer or poorer in sickness and in health. And what this is telling us is this. The marriage bond is stronger than blood. God is letting us know, first of all, he established marriage, not a government. He defines what marriage is, not not a country or anything else. And he's letting us know that the marriage bond is stronger than the parent-child bond. Uh, A man, and then a woman conversely, will leave their mother and father and cleave, be united to their wife. They will become one flesh in a bond stronger than the one that they had with their parent. Something new I'm forging, something new I am doing in you as husband and wife And then it says the two will become one flesh. Notice that last part. One flesh is more than just roommates. Some of you are here today and you're married and you're thinking, I feel more like a roommate than one flesh. Well, it could be that you are acting more like a roommate than one flesh as well. You see, what happens in marriage is our lives literally blend together. They come together as one on everything. Our plans, our goals, our wins, our losses, our commitments, our finances, our debts, our pains, our joys, we come together in everything and become one on everything, including child rearing. We become one on everything, and sex is a product of that oneness. And here's where we go wrong in our culture. We treat marriage so flippantly, we don't know what God has designed. And secondly, we treat sex so flippantly. We rip it out of this oneness where we become one in every way, and and, and we just have it out here as as a recreational thing. And it not only cheapens marriage, but it cheapens our marriage. And it cheapens the marriage we'll eventually have, and it cheapens our understanding of marriage, and it cheapens this oneness God eventually wants us to have with the person that we're married to. And God says, understand that sex then is a product of, of this one flesh that I am giving you, that I am doing for you within that context is something beautiful. Within that context is something amazing. And let it be. And you're going to need that within that context because marriage is maturing and you're going to go through hard times. And that's going to be something that keeps you together as well, even in the hard times. A oneness that God then brings. You see, we become one flesh. This is why divorce hurts so much. For those of you that have been personally affected by divorce, whether you have been divorced, your parents have been divorced, your kids have been divorced, understand why divorce hurts. Divorce hurts because it's the ripping apart of flesh. It's not natural. You see, if we become one flesh, and that's what God says happens in marriage, then divorce is like taking our skin and ripping it apart. And if you take your skin and rip it apart, don't try this at home, it will bleed. It will hemorrhage. If you don't seal it up and sew it up and take care of it, it will become infected. Some of us have open wounds of divorce in us. And they're so open, so gaping, so bleeding, that they have become infected with resentments and bitterness and all sorts of other things. And and when we finally do let God heal us, as God is close to the brokenhearted and heals their wounds, it always leaves a scar. And divorce hurts. It not only hurts the man and the wife if they're divorced, but it hurts the kids. It leaves a gaping open wound on the kids as well. This is why it hurts. You see, God says, I want you to understand marriage. I don't want to lay a guilt trip on you, but I want you to understand what I've designed, 
why I've designed it to be like this, so that you might also enter into that same understanding, so that you might enter into that same oneness, that same one flesh, that same maturity, that you might embrace that yourself. And then point three is this. The third ingredient that we really need in a healthy marriage is, well, vulnerability and transparency with nothing to hide. You see, God says, here is how I want you to live. Completely vulnerable, completely transparent, with nothing to hide, no masks, nothing else. Verse 25 says this. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Get this. So God creates Adam and Eve, bring them together. Eve is a gift from God. She is a beautiful creation from God, is received as that as he brings her to to Adam. And, And at that point, they have an intimacy between the two of them. They have an openness and a vulnerability and a transparency between the two of them that is unequaled. It's, it's what you and I crave. There are no masks. There is nothing hidden. There are no insecurities. There is no sense of shame. There is no sense of, well, I wonder if she would reject me if she knew this, or I wonder if he would reject me if he knew this. There is none of that. They are completely naked with each other, and they are completely without shame. You see, this is God's plan. He says, here is how I've created you to be in a marriage. We all deeply crave this intimacy. And maybe you're a guy and you're saying, well, I don't crave that kind of intimacy. My wife might crave it, but I don't. Why are men so attracted to porn? Because on a screen or a piece of paper or whatever, here you have a woman who is completely vulnerable to you. And there's something attractive about that. It's a cheap knockoff of the true intimacy God wants you to have in marriage. And here you are, much like ripping sex out of the context of oneness, ripping the intimacy out of the context of oneness and and settling for something less than what God has for you. And, and, And at the same point, also destroying not only yourself but those around you. You know, that's what happens because we desire that intimacy. That there is kind of a cheap knockoff of intimacy in porn. Or in some of those romance novels, novels ladies, that you might read. And, and, th- and there is that settling for something less than what God intends for us. So Adam and Eve are naked and they have no shame. Here they are, completely vulnerable before each other. Completely open, completely honest. Nothing to hide, no shame, no insecurities, but something happens. Something happens that reverses that shamelessness, that reverses that secure standing, that reverses that no fear kind of a thing that they've got going. And what happens is they disobey God and sin comes into the world. They are forbidden of a certain tree. They go and they eat the fruit from that tree. And all of a sudden in Genesis chapter 3, skipping ahead a chapter, verse 7, here's what we read. Then the eyes of both of them, Adam and Eve, were opened. And they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. Notice what they realized. All of a sudden, they realized they were naked. For the first time, they said, I've got to hide my vulnerability. I've got to hide my transparency. I can't be really open about who I am. I can no longer be free with who I am. Now I've got to cover, and I've got to hide, and that's exactly what they did. You see... That is a product of sin. It's shame, it's covering, it's hiding. God comes to Adam and says, Adam, what have you done? Where are you? Adam says in verse 10, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. God said, who told you that you were naked? Did you take the fruit that you weren't supposed to eat? And do you know what Adam did? He says, the woman that you put here gave me a bite to eat. Here's what Adam does. Instead of coming clean with God, he actually pins it on Eve, the woman that you put here. And if that doesn't work, guess who else he pins it on? The woman that you put here. It's her fault, and if that doesn't stick, it's your fault for making her and for putting her here. And all of a sudden, you've got these reactions of blame coming in and us not owning our fault and us trying to hide and escape this thing called sin. And we've been running and hiding and blaming ever since. And what fights against the intimacy that we have in marriage? It's the same thing. It's the fears, it's the blaming, it's the running, it's the hiding. It's the same kind of stuff. It's no coincidence that we're told in 1 John that God says, to be forgiven, I want you to come clean. 
If you say that you have no sin, you deceive yourself, and the truth is not in you, 1 John 1, 8. But if you confess your sin, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sin. If you come clean with your condition, with who you are, if you just become vulnerable with God, he's going to forgive you so that you can then be vulnerable with others. You see, Adam and Eve didn't learn how to, how to blame and how to... Uh, take on shame and how to fear and how to do all those things. It was a product of sin. And if you don't learn it, you don't unlearn it. It has to be removed. And that's why Jesus came, to remove this for us, to pay the penalty for our sin for us. You you see, some of us are here today, and we're in hurting marriages. And maybe we haven't realized until now that what we really need is Christ. What we really need is to come clean with who we are before him, so that we can then come clean with who we are before our spouse. Because that's what it takes, and that's what God is asking. Here's what we're told in 1 John chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. I've printed those in your bulletin. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. Get this real quick. Adam is afraid, so he hides. There is no fear in love. Perfect love, God's perfect love, removes this fear from us. As we come clean to God, God says, I want to remove the fear. I want to remove the shame. I want to remove all the junk. I want to remove the garbage from your heart. I want to replace it with my love, my life. And then it goes on to say, the one who fears has not been made perfect. The word is mature in love. We love because he first loved us. Bottom line, transparency with each other in marriage flows from a transparency with God. Are you transparent with God? You see, I had to learn this the hard way. In, in my marriage, and, and we still have struggles from time to time, but not nearly like we used to, you know, the fears that were driving her, that were driving me, the insecurities that were driving her, that were driving me, we had to ultimately go back to, to the cross. And what we found is the closer we grow to God, the closer we can grow to each other. Our level of vulnerability with God is directly related to our level of vulnerability with each other, and we learn this. Our our love from God is directly related to how well we can love each other. You know, and if we're and if we're drifting from God and we're not close to God, then we're not going to be close to each other either. You see, God is saying, I want you to first get transparent with me. I want to I want to remove the junk. I've paid the penalty for all that, Jesus says so that I can then put my life and my love in you. So just summing all this up, let me me bring it home. Some of us are here today, and we are in a good marriage. And and you're listening to what I'm talking about today, and you could preach the sermon better than me, because you've you've done it better than me, perhaps. I, I don't know. You know, good. Be a light shining for others with your marriage. Do that, because others need to see marriages, godly marriages working and working well. But some of us are here today, and quite frankly, things aren't going all that good. Maybe we don't even know they're not going good, but our wife can tell us that they're not going good, or vice versa, you know? And and we're going home to a loveless, lifeless, cold, maybe even a very bitter marriage. And we're going home to a home that is embittered. And we're going home to a place that we're really, frankly, not looking forward to. Here's what I would say to you. Because it just takes one of you to make a decision, to say, I'm going to rise above this. You you know that when you've got a conflict going on, if if one person decides, I'm going to quit being a part of the conflict, that changes the battleground, all of a sudden it's a different issue. You know, if one person just says, I'm going to stop, it changes the dynamics of the whole thing. You know, I'm going to ask you to be that one person. You know, be that one person. If that's you and you're going back to a marriage that is hurting or that's struggling, I want to ask you this. Will you seek to understand your spouse, your husband or your wife? Will you seek to grow in maturity instead of saying, this is too hard, I want out? Embrace maturity. Because you see, marriage is one way that God matures us, one way that God sanctifies us and grows us closer to himself and closer to holiness. You know, and, and, and instead of saying, I, I want out, embrace transparency and let that begin with your transparency with God. For your part, let me ask you this. Will you go to the source of love, to God, and allow him to continue to perfect you? 
Will you do that? Why am I asking you this? Because we're in crisis. The marriages are in a crisis today. 60% don't make it. And the, quite frankly, the statistics aren't getting any better. They're getting worse. You know, why am I asking you to do this? Because God says a lot is riding on this. You know, divorce is like a, an open wound that you carry the rest of your life. Even if it's healed, you'll have the scar. It is on your kids as well. Because marriages are under an attack. That's why I'm asking you this. So I'm asking you, will you commit to marriage God's way? And I want to end by praying for you. If you will do that and you're married and you're saying, I want to commit to marriage God's way and I want, uh, I want to leave differently, would you stand and I want to pray with you and for you as we close? Heavenly Father, I and we who aren't standing, I, I, we are praying for those who are. We pray, Lord, for their marriages. We ask that you would strengthen them. We ask that you would ultimately reveal yourself through them. Be a light shining in the darkness through them. Grow them in their marriage. Lord God, may they increase in their understanding of themselves and of each other. May they grow in their understanding of what you intended marriage to be. May they grow as, as they continue to grow in that oneness where they come together on all things as they are now one flesh and you're working that out in their lives. May they grow in that. May you continue, Lord, to allow them to be naked and unashamed, first and foremost with you and then with each other. Father, if there are secrets, if there are other things, if there are things that they are holding on to thinking, I, I can't let this go, or I've got insecurities, Lord, I pray that you would begin to burn that out of them. I ask that you would begin to, to just do a work inside of their hearts and inside of their lives that leads them to truly be vulnerable and transparent. And so, Lord, I pray for a healing in marriages that are hurting, and I pray a prayer of thanksgiving for the marriages that are reflecting you. But we pray for our marriages. In Christ's name we do this. Amen.